you got it. it. This is Binary Jazz, and it's a podcast, and we're here uh, talking about things, uh, and this is our second episode of of 2023, doing mood lighting. I'm going to do some mood lighting for this meeting, yeah. (laughs) And and if you are, uh, it's an audio podcast, so uh, if you are not watching uh, us on YouTube, uh, you will not get the benefit of Gary's mood lighting. Um, Well... It's which not responding, which isn't working anyway. So you're not Just missing out <laughs> on much. Just imagine, what? imagine there being mood lighting. It's... What a mood! <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> when the mood lighting doesn't work. Uh, That's weird. But but you probably aren't watching us on uh, YouTube anyway. I did actually get a YouTube, uh, uh, I don't know, channel update thing, and it says like total minutes watched on the channel last week was like 11 minutes or something. I'm like, hey, that's 11 minutes that people watched our show. That's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you don't know us, we're online. It's binaryjazz.com. We're a .com. Uh, We've been a .com for a little bit. We were previously a .us. And if this is your first episode, I don't know, listen to some back episodes or something. Um, Yeah, we're we're here. We're alive. Uh, It's 2023, people. 2023. What else can you ask? <laughs> what, how are you all feeling about 2023? Have we had this conversation already? No, we talked about um, uh, time capsules last week. One of the things I did want to talk about, maybe yeah. one of the things that was on my mind for last week, was the idea of like resolutions. How you feel yeah. about them? Do you make them? Do you want to make them? Um, yeah. And the only reason why I was thinking about that was because I tweeted. Uh, well, I got a Kindle. Um, I asked for a Kindle, uh, for Christmas. My parents gave me a Kindle. Uh, I have a Kindle now. Uh, and the Kindle, uh, is enabling me to read all of the romance novels that Aaron has been reading over the last, like, I don't know, however many years. Uh, and so like I I tweeted like 2023 is the year that I read romance novels. That's 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 the distinction. So I don't know that that's a resolution. That's just a thing that's going to happen because it it just is. There's so the the first out there. the first series like... the first series that I'm working through uh, is or at least I read the first book and I'm reading the second book now is um, uh, Bromance Book Club. Oh yeah, I read the first one of that. Yeah, um, so it's basically about. Uh, a bunch of and it, it's probably fitting that it's the first one because <laughs> it, it pretty i guess i guess as as a male approaching uh romance novels as a genre bromance book club is probably the best way to get your feet wet because the whole premise of the series is that it's a bunch of dudes who read romance novels for the purpose of learning about things that women want and are interested in, in order to help them with their own relationships. Um, that, ah, that's, that's the sales pitch. Yeah. And, and so like, I guess as an entry into, into romance novels, it's pretty, it's pretty apt because, because it already sort of sets the, sets the stage. Um, like there's not going to be the analysis, the, like the self-referential analysis about like <laughs> romance novels as a genre in any other romance novels that you get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not not any of the historical ones or. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah, my twenty. No, that's that's like, my twenty twenty three is is romance novels. I think that romance novels have come a long way, or at least. I think the way so too. That publishers are approaching it, or like doing advertising or whatever marketing for them well, like i i think about like so when i was in college which admittedly is over 20 years ago now this is terrifying i think you should thing. say two decades because yeah that all right like sorry less. two decades ago when I was... yeah. <laughs> sounds a lot more palatable. Um, so so we i had a band and um and we were an experimental band and uh with with a couple of uh of folks in in our you know experimental you know education program and there was a point so we lived in a dorm and I, I, dorms have things that are left behind from who knows how long ago and how they got there and whatever and they just like they're just in public spaces randomly um and because 
our our group was all about like embracing random and improvisational things like we would like it was all an improvisational band we just like made up instruments and like used the vacuum cleaner was an instrument for in in at least one occasion and um you know drumsticks on the railings in the hallway down in the basement was an instrument uh, until uh until somebody upstairs complained um and uh so there was uh, a point there was a song uh a a composition i guess uh that included uh the work <laughs> a book that was just one of those randomly lying around books called uh night of fire by shannon drake and so the song was shannon drake night of fire because that was what was on the cover of the book and uh one of uh one of the band members just like picked a random page and started reading from the book and and what i think of or what i used to think of in my head and, and so on the cover of the book is you know Fabio looking like muscular, tanned, shirtless man holding woman in sort of like a recline, like sweeping her back off her feet kind of with like, she's got this like wispy, like, uh, like flowy silk gown thing. The, the background is like this like deep sort of like <laughs> reddish purple kind of thing, you know, like it's very like whew, sweep me off my feet kind of thing. And, and, and so in my head, what I'm thinking of when I think, uh, you know, prior you know before like the last however many years is shannon drake and night of fire as the epitome of you know what romance novels mm -hmm. is it's all about like <laughs> shirtless men that are super toned and damsels in distress and like you know reinforcing sexist tropes and just like all that stuff um but I, I don't think i think for a long time that 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 has not been the case i think it's thing and that's also sort of like the subtext of the bromance book club is that like actually there's a lot of like feminist shit in there because like the writers of these things are currently by and large women talking about issues that deal that affect them and so and and so it's sort of by nature uh more of a a, a genre for for communicating you know it, sub, subversively or otherwise uh, like feminist ideas. Mm -hmm. And like publishers are, there's so many, I don't know, there's just so many more. There's queer romance novels. There's yeah. like, there's so much, well, I don't know, not that when I was young, I was reading a ton of like <clears throat> overly adult material, but like there's just so much more readily available and like marketed mm -hmm. as like, this is for anyone, like, which is just nice. Um, Apparently my computer's going to sleep unless I plug it in. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. Might lose Gary. Um, but resolutions. I don't have any. <laughs> I am too tired. Um <laughs> resolution to be less tired. Yeah, I would I mean I'd like to be the person that sets up resolutions, but the truth is is that I feel like I'm constantly reevaluating yeah like trying to rehaul my life yeah i mean month. that's like i wouldn't have like i don't i don't do that. that's not a thing that i do but like i like it when people i i love hearing other people's resolutions because mm. i find it inspiring mm. but i know that not that i'm setting myself up for failure but i know that i have to do things in like baby steps i have to take it much smaller i have to i just can't make a really grand resolution for the year i know some people that do like word of the year like an overarching theme mm. um which is an interesting but see again it's like a commitment thing i can't mm -hmm. choose one word so <laughs> i also and this is again not a as much of a resolution as a this is just the way things are uh is that 2023 for me is a year where i am looking into and or embracing other uh, tabletop role-playing systems uh, mm. and this ties into uh, some of the drama that's happening in the D, &D space uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks which which we can we can go down that rabbit hole if 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 if, if we really if it want comes to that. <laughs> yeah there's a, there's a deep rabbit hole um, mm. there's a lot of thoughts and I actually um, uh, I wasn't going to make a thing of it on the Discord channel that I started for my campaign because I didn't think that it really affected me or my group, but things are coming to pass that do affect me and my group a little bit more um, and uh, or might. 
Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I guess, I guess I should do this. And I guess I should do this other thing. Um, so I guess I'll start, I'll start dancing around it uh, and I'll just bore you with the details. Um, so, and, and my, my take on them. So late last year, probably at the end of Q3, uh, there was like a shareholders meeting uh, for uh, Hasbro um, and uh, they uh, where they had the head of uh, product, I think, in Hasbro and like the, the CEO of Wizards of the Coast that's owned by Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast, the company that, that owns D&D. They also own other intellectual properties like Magic the Gathering uh, that are sort of like tangentially related, other sort of gaming stuff. Um, and they, they, the, one of the key takeaways, at least for the gaming community from that, because uh, normally like we wouldn't give a shit about shareholders yeah. meetings uh was that the ceo of wizards of the coast said with her actual human mouth that dungeons and dragons is under monetized and anybody who's been in the corporate world uh or adjacent to the corporate world long enough uh knows that when a company says that something is under monetized that means that there's going to be significant changes in order to try to monetize that thing and it was hinted at then uh, a couple things uh they talked about wanting to follow the video game model of like microtransactions the idea mm. being that like mm -hmm. Uh, there's like digital content and you can get like, I don't know, like a little miniature or you get you know, like D&D &D and Beyond, uh, which was also acquired by Wizards of the Coast last year, it used to be an independent just product that was put out there, um, was purchased, uh, acquired by Wizards of the Coast so that they could then push digital content to it. And it it seems like a right, the right thing. It was a large, widely used tool. It makes sense that there's a single channel. So you don't have to with the idea that like. If I'm using D and D Beyond and I'm buying the book, I don't have to buy the physical book and a digital copy of the book separately. Like that opens the possibility to wizards saying, if you buy the book, you get a code so that you have access to the content online. That's a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, and it also, uh, but also D and D Beyond today has things like you know you can have like it's a dice roller, so you can have like custom dice that you pay for, and there's different tiers where you can have like you know access, and you, you can buy the content, the digital content there. Um, but basically, the under monetization thing comes out of the idea that the people that are spending the most money on Dungeons and Dragons are people like me, the dungeon masters who are very invested in the product because they are running the games for a bunch of people and they need to have all of this content and need to have all these books and they need to have a whole bunch of, of stuff at their fingertips so they can they can you know run these games um but players don't need any of that really they can get character sheets online or from their dm they can just use pencil and paper they don't need any of that stuff maybe they might want to buy a supplement to like learn more about the system but they don't need to and so yeah. and so wizards of uh so so dungeons and dragons like is making money off of the really highly invested people uh like me and not making very much money off of uh individuals um and and uh so so yeah they wanted to do like uh go ahead I was going to say I would like to um, suggest that our topic today should be under monetization, and we should explore what thing, what other things are also under monetized. Sure. <laughs> this um, podcast. Yeah, this podcast is very. Yeah, under well, there's a great example. Yep, that was the first one I thought of too. <laughs> yep. Yep. Wait. So, so is, is the issue that that they're then going to be monetizing it for like random players? Is that kind of the that's the, that they that's the theory? Yeah. Moving? That's the theory. So they they bought uh, they bought D and D Beyond, and they announced that they were going to start working on an Unreal Engine based uh, immersive uh, tabletop, digital tabletop, virtual tabletop. Uh, where it, so using wait, Unreal wait, wait. Engine, there's got to be some more buzzwords you can cram in there. <laughs> so so using Unreal Engine like to to create like uh, a a three D. Yeah, 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 a 3D thing that you can see, like, the, the stuff, uh, which yeah. sounds cool, I guess. But obviously, they would charge money for that. Uh, and then, right. but once you have that thing, then, okay, well, then you want to pay money and, to, right. well, like, no, first you have to buy the costumes. NFT and exchange the NFT. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. and, the, and the NFTs this, was a thing, too. But all of this is conjecture. Like, it's it hasn't been on the table yet it's just been well they did start building they did start building the the unreal engine based virtual okay. tabletop thing um i mean basically it was like this is the thing that we identified these are the things that we're going to do in 2023 right. uh 
among those things and and in line with the under monetization was we're going to revamp the open gaming license that we've had for uh, I think it's been like 23 years. And what the open gaming license does is back in, in Dungeons and Dragons 3.0 or 3.5, um, they created this open gaming license that allowed people to use the core rule set of Dean of Dungeons and Dragons um, to, to build uh, derivative products. Um, so yeah. it allowed the whole gaming sphere to sort of like say, Hey, I don't need to write the core mechanics. Or I don't need to write the core system. I can borrow a whole bunch of stuff from uh, the SRD or the standard rules definition. I can borrow all this stuff and just this is just and just write add-on content and then sell it myself. And as long as it it meets the requirements of the OGL, then then I'm I'm in the clear. The the um, the proposed OGL would cover. Uh, the changes in the industry over the last 20 years. It would address things like NFTs. It would address the fact that people are making millions of dollars off of Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. and Dungeons and Dragons doesn't get any of that money. Uh, mm -hmm. So like obviously people's uh, eyes turn to things like Critical Role. They make millions of dollars a year uh, doing a streaming, a streaming campaign. They have uh, products, they have swag, they have all sorts of stuff uh, and they don't need to pay Wizards of the Coast anything really uh, because other than like what they would normally do, which is like, you know, buying the one book a year or five books a year or whatever. Um, to, to, and, and they have their own content that has come out officially under the Wizards of the Coast uh, banner. They also wrote a book uh, entirely separate from Wizards of the Coast. They've self-published a book about, uh, that's a D&D &D book that has their own content that sort of builds uh, a different part of the world that that is actually covered in the book that was under Wizards of the Coast. So there's this weird like relationship of, of things that are uh, published under the Wizards umbrella uh, versus uh, independent. And it's allowed a lot of like independent companies to just become like exist in, in a space. And honestly, Dungeons and Dragons itself has benefited from that ecosystem because a lot of their core writers or a lot of writers they bring in to contract to work on these books come from these independent publishers that like you've published a couple things and like that was really cool. So we're gonna call you in and see if you're interested in working on our next project. A lot of people have, have, have gotten into the industry through through that and a lot of people have like you know worked on core DD &D titles and then gone and worked out at these other companies so like it's it's created this open ecosystem um, as a hasbro shareholder mm -hmm. i'm extremely uninformed <laughs> i didn't even know they actually own wizards of the coast mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah are you really <laughs> i have eight dollars or something yeah okay. a fraction of a share yeah <laughs> yeah like, wow. i should pull it up i should see how much i actually own. well and that's Hold that's on. the reason i'm curious how that's much the I reason care. that's the reason why like magic the gathering does these like secret layer uh which is like this weird side thing that they do where they do like um weird crossover stuff with other ips so like they have like right now I, when I go into Magic the Gathering online, there's like these Transformers card sleeves um, and other things because they own a whole bunch of IPs because they're Hasbro and they own everything. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so that- if, if you were to pivot to a different game, because mm -hmm. my first thought was Magic the Gathering, but if it's owned by the same people, then mm -hmm. forget it, it's out, I guess. I was wrong. I own uh, $14.65 in Hasbro. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, you're, this is when we discover Gary is, owns 51% of it's <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Um, it's just like, it's, like it's, just something that hasn't come up. It's a little <laughs> bit below a quarter of a share. Actually, that's probably wrong. I have to check one other account. But like, what would you pivot to? Like, what are the, what are the other things? Well, the most obvious, the most obvious parallel to Dungeons and Dragons is Pathfinder. So oh. Pathfinder exists purely because of the OGL, because basically, uh, they released uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, 3.5, uh, and then at that point, Pathfinder is like, well, hey, we don't agree with some of these changes, so we're going to take a fork of Dungeons and Dragons based on the OGL and the things that are in the SRD, and we're going to make our own game, and we're going to call it Pathfinder. It works exactly the same, uses all the same dice, uh, it's got a few different mechanics, uh, and that, and they've got their whole, like, a whole ecosystem over there where it's just like, it's, but it's, it's like, not the same, but it's parallel, right? And then since then, the other companies have sort of done similar things. But that's that's the that's the you know, like that's the closest sort of direct parallel. There's obviously been differences since then. That was you know many years ago that that happened, and they've evolved, and they've got like Pathfinder Two E now, and yeah. and whatever. Um, well, that can I interrupt though, and I want to talk about stock specifically. I think <laughs> I'm almost a third of a share is what I own. It turns out between two accounts. 
We've um, lost all our all our listeners at this point. <laughs> so there. Oh wait. Oh wait. It's about to get a lot better. Um, looking at some numbers, I have their their five year average yield dividend yield is three point two three. Um, and they're currently showing a yield of 4.59, which shows a dividend average imbalance of 1.36, which is why they are interesting to me and why I have a tiny amount of their stock in purchased in the last few months. That makes sense because their stock value would drop as market sentiment would shift. But I think long-term play, they're still stable and boring yeah. despite the, the churning waters. So yeah, I don't think that... I don't... Gary's investment advice is buy Hasbro. <laughs> And hold it because it'll settle down and you'll make some dividends on it. Actually, that's it. Maybe wait uh, because it gets worse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I I'll be selling think, my shares yeah, by the end know. of this episode. I, or yeah, no, shares, don't, don't, you don't want to sell. You don't want to sell if you have them. Although I do them. love, I do love the idea of like Gary's stock advice. Gary's stock partner. advice. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's going to be a sub a sub uh, section of of the podcast. We'll get shut down by the SEC, where I'm like, you should put three dollars into Hasbro, and it'll be <laughs> worth four dollars and twelve cents this time next year. Oh no, we only have ten minutes, and I can't summarize in ten minutes. Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> it gets worse. So there's a new, yeah, it gets worse. It gets worse. So, so there, so a leak of the. Oh, the revised OGL uh, came out last week, and among yes. other things, uh, the the revised OGL would rescind the previous version of the OGL. So anything that was under the previous OGL would no longer be valid. Um, it required uh, so everybody would have to agree to the new OGL. Um, it doesn't. It only covers print and like you know digital content, like in terms of like PDFs. Like it doesn't. It doesn't cover. Uh, other stuff like nfts or live streams mm -hmm. or whatever like that stuff isn't covered by the ogl anymore um and uh it would it, it starts getting into this space of this under monetization because if you make content that is ogl content and you're just like me and you're making less than fifty thousand dollars you're fine if you make more than $50,000 on OGL content, you need to report it to Wizards of the Coast. You need to tell them what it is and enter it into some sort of, I don't know, directory. You have to give them a copy of it. Um, and they can then take that content and use it in future publications without asking permission. If you make more than 750,000, and this is gross. This isn't like take home. This is like your gross sales. If you make more than $750,000 uh, on your OGL content, then you need to pay them a royalty of like, I don't know, like something ridiculous. I think it's like 50%, um, like a huge amount of money. And to be clear, independent publishing does not have, is not known for high margins. Most of these, yeah, like in, most of these indie, indie developers are are just barely covering their books um and just and being able to pay their like artists and writers so like there's not a lot of money to be had and this is wizard saying hey if you want to use uh, our system you need to give us all the money and then let us use your content in perpetuity the other thing that it said was that those numbers the 50k and 750k yeah they can change them uh, if they want. So if you had a successful Kickstarter, you made $300,000, they can come in and say, hey, you, that looks really cool. I'm just going to take that and now you owe us money. Um, and like that kills independent publishing effectively because there's no way was, like if, with that uncertainty, there's no way that anyone's going to do a Kickstarter when they they know that if it's successful, wizards might come down from on high and say, give us all your money uh, and they're not going to be able to pay the people yeah. that they said that they're going to pay. So capitalism mandates several things. First, as a shareholder, I'm outraged at uh, espionage and a leak. That's not really true. I couldn't care less. <laughs> um, but but I but I will take this this other side just for a moment and say, because uh, I'm curious. Um, it sounds like like the licensing is version. So how is that different from like MIT like licensing where you can say like, well, we we actually publish this under the old version, so. Go pound sand. Because there, because licenses can be revoked, and the original uh, 1.0 A OGL license was not an irrevocable license. So because it was not created yeah. as an irrevocable license, they can go in later and say, "Yeah, nah." And but but don't but but there's also I mean like I'm not suggesting this because this is just dumb. But there's also like from a legal perspective, isn't there like a point where you come in with an attorney and say like this is a this is an unreasonable contract at that point? Like, well, maybe perhaps, and that that's something to be explored. 
it's also worth noting now, that as a shareholder that angers me that they're opening themselves up to a lawsuit sure uh I need a this is capitalist on it for the yeah. rest of this episode yeah. <laughs> Apparently, um, I thought you were going to say like Hasbro shareholder. <laughs> it, it's also worth noting. I'm wearing my Hasbro shareholder shirt. It's also worth noting from a from a um, from a uh, a copyright standpoint is that you can't copyright game mechanics. So you can it's... create a new game, use the same dice, use the same like words to describe different like a you know attributes for characters and and call it like blizzards and bunions and um and that's that's okay but if you use certain content is that a plan or, wizards and onions or what is that i don't i don't know I wizards just, and, i'm not I, okay i wasn't sure what the second word was just, like, just, wizards just and... something that was b and b instead of d and d i don't know got it i was trying to figure out like i got blizzards and i was thinking oh wizards and then i was trying to figure out what rhymed with bunions <laughs> like wizards and kind of dungeons. i don't even know <laughs> Um, so okay, then, sorry. so then, I apologize that I keep interrupting, but this is a couple of days ago. A couple of days ago, uh, a somebody inside of Wizards sent out an email to members of uh, the D and D community, say basically saying like shit's going down and it's bad, and I'm concerned as somebody who cares about this game. And what they communicated was that you know Top Brass doesn't care about players. They're hoping that this OGL outrage because. There is outrage. Uh, they're hoping that this OGL outrage will just blow over, and they're the only means uh, that they have for really tracking interest or investment in the game currently is subscriptions to D&D Beyond. So what happens the next day? Well, obviously, there are so many people canceling their D&D Beyond subscriptions that uh, two things happen. One, the unsub the cancel subscription page on D and D Beyond crashes, yeah, <laughs> because it, because there's so many people doing it. And the second thing is they actually go into the interface and make it more difficult to cancel your subscription. Yeah. Um. And this is where I come in, and this is where I I come into my group because I'm using D and D Beyond, and I've been using it for a couple of years, and I've been paying a subscription because there's a tool in there that allows you to do build encounters and custom monsters and things, and this is a lot easier than paper and pen writing down initiative tracking yeah, and damage yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Um, and there was another tool that I was using that was free, that was open source, that was out in the community um, that I was using for a long time before that. But they had some sort of server issue where everything on the server got wiped. And so my choices were use this thing that there's all this advertising for and all the big players say is great and whatever. And it's got all the things in there. And maybe I need to like hack it a little bit and maybe it's not the best interface, but it's the thing that I know is there or start over from scratch completely with brand new stuff on this open source thing. Uh, and obviously, I went with the thing that exists, right? I don't want to have to like re-import all. I don't the know content. why that's obvious to anyone. There's, it's absolutely not ob obvious to me. <laughs> no. Well, I would. I would be like, clearly, and, I have to and build here's, this thing. And this is where it will we never exist. And this is where oh, we well. get. This is where yeah. we get to today. Is like, well, now it's like, well. I know that Wizards cares about my subscription because – and by by continuing to subscribe, I'm basically telling them that, like, I'm okay with this stuff because that's how they're tracking that. Uh, and and I don't feel that way. So, uh, so that from. was where I, I made the announcement in, in my Discord channel. Like, I'm going to switch because I don't feel good about this, and so I'm going to stop telling you all to use D&D &D Beyond and use this other thing instead, maybe, if you want to, I guess, because they're not assholes. <laughs> And so this is, I think this is a great example of like past performance does not indicate, you know, future returns. Mm. Like completely oblivious to this was I, as I, you know, allocated and one percent of my investment for that week into Hasbro, right? And what's like, also happened in in the interim is that a whole bunch of independent ever. publishers have um announced uh, that they're going to be releasing their own OGLs, and and several of them have said that we're going to build our own system so that we don't have to – whatever Wizards does over there, we're just going to do mm -hmm. our own thing, and they can do that, and we're not going to make our products uh, dependent upon – upon. There's some there's some cold calculation here too that sucks, that they're like, well, if it's under-monetized, who cares if we piss off some people because we're still going to be better off at the end. We're going to get more money out of the deal even if we chase off a bunch of people, right? Yeah, right. So that would be and, my, and especially that, if yeah. especially when when their goal is to suck uh, out as as much money as as they're planning to, because basically what they're saying is rather than hiring more writers to give us more content, we're going to take the writers of other 
companies yeah. and integrate their products into our product and make money off of their material. Um, so we could build out our own internal writing staff, but we don't which, have to because other people exist and they'll do that work for us. Which to me reads like, we don't actually want you to do external material. Yes, exactly. Like that's, that's really what they're saying. Yep. It's like, instead of making the license that you cannot do this, we're saying you can, but it's going to make absolutely no sense for you unless you give it away. Exactly. Which, okay, I guess, <laughs> but. And, hmm. and like, if you were an independent, if you did do a Kickstarter okay. for a new, a new book, what? like in order to pay wizards, you'd need to like double the price, right? If you're going to take home and pay your your people what they what they would have what learned software otherwise. would you like to kill with it like using the same licensing approach <laughs> and why is it wordpress <laughs> <laughs> and that's when zoom kicks us out <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm on record saying that um and i'm fine with it tell us i, I don't know yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, it definitely is. It's going to kill uh, a lot. Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at binaryjazz. Special thanks to Serpiente Negra Ensemble for the use of their tracks for our intro and outro music. You can find them online at serpientenegra.bandcamp.com. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the forum on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.